Welcome to the Symposium on Advancing Equity in Higher Education on Long Island. I'm your host of Freedom, the Art of Risk Through Jazz Improvisation. My name is Victor Santiago. I'm a SUNY Stony Brook Library Supervisor, and my pronouns are his and he. Before the presentation begins, there are a few quick announcements of housekeeping matters that I would like to mention. First of all, you will notice two options on your screen, a chat and a QA tool. As your moderator, I will monitor both throughout the session. Questions are welcomed by the, by the Q&A tool throughout the presentation. You can chat with the panelists to help with any technical issues and use chat for conversation among attendees. We're dedicated to providing a symposium experience free from all forts of harassment and inclusive of all people. Please re be respectful to presenters and attendees' experiences when participating in the session. The session is being recorded and will be available after the presentation uh, on the SBU Library YouTube channel. Please be aware that chat transcripts, even private chats, will be captured by Zoom. I will now introduce the presenters and again, thank you for joining. Dr. Thomas Manuel is a trumpet player, jazz historian, director of the SBU Young Artist Program, where he directs the jazz program in residence at the Jazz Loft, a space he founded in May 2016, joining, joining jazz, performance, preservation, and education, celebrating the past, present, and future. Manuel established a music program for underprivileged students in Africa and Haiti. His most recent endeavor includes educational outreach to Cuba, collaborating with several top jazz artists, professors, producers, and independent filmmakers. You are the presenter, Ray Anderson, director of the jazz studies at SBU since 2003, attended the University of Chicago Lab School, where one of his classmates is another notable tram trombone original, George Lewis, and his teacher included Frank Tria. And he's played with Jimmy Jaffer, Jaffer, uh and Barry Altsch Altschutz. Altschutz. And yeah, I, I'm butchering, I'm so sorry. And Gary Hemingway. He garnered uh, attention with the collective bands, including the funk oriented Slickophonics and the trio bass drum bone. Ray has been named five straight years as the best trombonist in downbeat critics poll and declared the most exciting slide brass player of his generation by Penguin Guides to Jazz on CD. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you your presenters. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Thank you. Well, I just want to say what an honor it is to be a part of this and welcome to all of you out there. Um, the computer screen is far away from us, so Victor's going to be our, our wonderful moderator that will make sure that any of your comments or questions are included. Uh, I just want to say before we even get going, we really want this to be a dialogue and conversation. So please, if you have a question, don't feel like you're interrupting, put it in the chat and Victor will interrupt us. So you don't even feel bad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we do want to invite you to be a part of this. And uh, I thought it would just be good to give a, a quick, short introduction as to you know, what is the point of this and why are we here and why are we talking about this? And I think in the simplest way, we could share with you all that jazz is without doubt a wonderful art form that has been connected to American culture and our society for well over 100 years now. I love the metaphor of jazz as the soundtrack to our nation and all the events that transpire, good and bad. And jazz is very much so a conversation. And it's a conversation that's been going on for a long time. And it's a conversation that most importantly is not over. And it's a conversation that really is quite admirable in that it is absolutely inclusive and not exclusive. Everyone is allowed to join in the conversation, regardless of age, regardless of color of skin, regardless of wealth or status or lack thereof or anything. And I'm sorry, can you speak a, a tad bit louder? Yeah, sure. I'll just get into the mic. Thanks. I appreciate it so much. We want to get it good. Mm -hmm. And this conversation uh, that is continuing to this day um, and this 
figure, this individual we call Jazz, has a lot of characteristics that are really admirable and, and worthy of, of imitation, even if you're not a musician. Uh, I always tell my students in, in my history of jazz class, I, I'll put a chair there and I'll say, if, if I could have jazz here for our class, if jazz was an actual person that could sit here, you would want to hang out with them because they're patient, they're kind, they're humorous, mm. they're inspiring, they're tolerant, they're, you know, there's so many characteristics, like, you know, and I always joke and I say, like, you know, it would be the kind of person your parents would want you to date, you know, <laughs> be the kind of boss you want to have. So really, uh, we are here to talk about jazz, and we're here to talk about those characteristics that we believe speak to this big topic of the symposium, the topic of equity, but more importantly speak to the conversation that we feel should be more prevalent in higher education and, and in workplaces and in the community and in you could really fill in the blank. So that's really the, the introduction here. We're gonna be talking about some aspects of what is jazz, why is it important, what does it have to say, and what could it teach us about these things like equality and freedom and tolerance and patience and, and many other things. Um, and we're basing this all on the four freedoms, according to Billy Strayhorn. Billy Strayhorn was a wonderful composer, arranger, and performer. He was, uh, in, in the history books like to call him the alter ego of the great Duke Ellington. Uh, but they were, without doubt, um, very much so respectful of each other um, and, and worked together. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. But um, we're kind of basing this whole hour and a half on these four freedoms, and we're going to delve into those a bit. But first, we thought it would be cool. Um, I, well, first, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Ray if he has any comments to add, but then we want to play for you a bit. So, Ray, if you have anything to add to that intro. <laughs> That's a wonderful intro, actually. And um, I think what we hope to demonstrate is uh, all of those qualities, particularly democracy, jazz is a inherently democratic music. To play it successfully, you have to be willing to lead and you have to be willing to follow. You have to be able to support what the other people in the group are doing in a way that furthers the sound of the whole group. So it's a perfect metaphor for how uh, we wish and hope that American society can work in that, as Tom said, everyone's welcome. Everyone has their time and chance to speak and put in what they want to say. Everyone also is actively involved in supporting what anyone else is saying. So this is what makes a jazz group's performance exciting, successful, moving, you know, emotionally very powerful. And this is some principle we could all use a whole lot of right now in society. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, that's why. That's why I have jazz in the symposium on advancing equity. It's also important to, to point out that jazz is African American music. It's uniquely American in that it's a synthesis of African rhythms, harmonies, uh, melodies, understanding of music with you know, European instruments and European uh, ways of understanding harmony and rhythm and all that. So it, it's really representative of the whole of America, as Tom just said, you know, this is sort of the soundtrack of, of America in many ways. There's a, a wonderful book by Robert O'Malley that, that's entitled The Jazz Cadence of American Culture, which is a fantastic compendium of a bunch of different articles about exactly this, how 
Uh, these sensibilities permeate every aspect of American culture, even when it's completely unrecognized. So, uh, so yeah, we thought we play a little bit mm -hmm. just to give you an idea of how this communication works. And of course, we don't have a typical jazz instrumentation here. Instead, <laughs> we have one trumpet and one trombone. And normally, there would be also somebody playing a bass and a drum set and probably a piano or a guitar or something. So uh, this will be a different kind of jazz band. This is a really small one. <laughs> and just to emphasize, because we, we don't know who you all are and what your backgrounds are, and I'm guessing that there's probably a lot of you that are not trained, seasoned jazz musicians, uh, but we also don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, so if, if you are, we, you know, we apologize for that as well. Full disclaimers here. Um, but just so you know, what we're about to play, we, we don't have, we didn't pick a tune, we don't have music, this isn't a, a famous composition that we both have memorized. We actually are going to literally communicate with each other through the language of music. There is no tune, there is no key, there is no tempo, there was no discussion before, other than that if we're going to be talking about this kind of communication and freedom and risk taking, uh, we probably should practice what we preach and show it to you. So, uh, <laughs> so here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Risk, in other words, is an important element. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. 
before we dive into the first uh, freedom is that is communication. And, uh, you know, I'll mention a few characteristics and I'd love if in the chat, maybe um, people could offer, um, without being too teacherly here, um, but what did you observe in our conversation? Maybe if you want to pick a descriptor word um, or an emotion that you sensed or something that you felt was happening in an existence between the two of us. But maybe we could, can we get maybe some of those in the chat? And I'm gonna see if I could get the chat here. Or if you have a question, yeah, ask a question. Uh, the one characteristic I would start with though is, is certainly um, the fact that there, there is a risk, there is, which is what's so beautiful about jazz, is that, you know, we are taking that moment to be vulnerable and to put ourselves out there for criticism, be it positive or negative or both. And there is that, like, okay, here we go. We've never done this before. And, and um, we are going to talk about the critic in a bit and how that you know, we all have that in our heads speaking to us, mm -hmm. but risk is one of them. But Victor, I can't see to read, but maybe you could, because uh, we can't hear you, maybe you could say some of these things in the chat for us. Absolutely. We got some nice comments. The free form jazz improv seems very liberating. And another comment is it, feel, it felt lighthearted and almost silly. Yeah, feeling a play. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Yeah. Um... One of the ways this is very tied to quote unquote life itself is uh, that we don't know where we're going, so we don't know how we're going to get there. But we do believe in ourselves, and we do have the intention and the, the stand, we take the stand that we will play something that has meaning. Absolutely. Now, of course, one person's meaning is another person's gibberish, you know, and that's part of the risk of art, and that's part of the stuff that we cannot control. But in, in terms of you know, going forward and teaching and young people being in college and, and all of that kind of stuff. Believing in yourself and what feels good to you is very, very important and needs to be nourished by education. I, I always love this William Gates quote that says that education is not the filling of a bucket, but the lighting of a fire. Mm -hmm. So when we play music like that, we don't know what we're gonna do or where we're going. What we're really relying upon is our intention to communicate and make something that, yes, lighthearted in a certain way, but lighthearted in a, in a actually very sophisticated way, which is the, the alchemy of the blues. Maybe we have to get into that a little later on, but that, that 
These comments are very perceptive. Yeah. I think that um, the, the comment about the blues is, is really wonderful. There are some myths about jazz. You know, a lot of people think that the blues was the first jazz, but the blues actually existed well before jazz. I mean, a lot of early jazz was the blues. Um, people think that uh, jazz was born 100% in New Orleans, which it was a very important place, absolutely, but um, quite often what is overlooked is places like St. Louis and Memphis and even the San Francisco Bay Area at the very same time as everything that was happening in New Orleans. But without getting too much into a, a history lesson, what is beautiful about the blues in all those places coming up, um, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke a lot about how jazz speaks for life, and he said how the blues tells the story of life's difficulties. And he went on to say that if we kind of think on that and how the blues speaks about those difficulties, um, that you will realize that what the blues does is it, it takes those hard realities of life, those tough circumstances that we deal with, and it puts them into music. And the process is not just to, you know, the word kind of implies we might think, well, it's just to be sad, I'm singing the blues, but it's to put those bad experiences or those challenges into the music only to come out the other end with a hope and a sense of triumph. And, and Dr. King said, this is triumphant music, which is why I think it's so important to be talking about it, to be having the conversation, yes. to have it on college campuses, to celebrate jazz studies programs, to collaborate, collaboration, which is such a huge component of jazz, to be collaborating with history departments, with philosophy departments, with math departments, with, I mean, you fill in the blank, we should, we should be collaborating with every department on campus yeah, you know, to keep that conversation going, which is so inclusive. I love before we started, Ray was talking about playing in New York, living in New York for 15 years and playing with Colombian bands and, and Puerto Rican bands and salsa bands and Cuban bands and all these different cultures that have so many different things, yet share a lot in common. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the beauty of this music is in places like New Orleans and St. Louis and New York and Chicago and the list goes on and on. You had so many different people contributing to this art form that yes, was born here in but created from so many people that were from so many different places. And we, you know, we're quick to say Africa, but man, the Caribbean, Haiti, Cuba, Spain, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, I mean, right. so many places that just is like, Winter Marsala says, man, that big pot of gumbo, right? Pot. All sorts of stuff in there. It's big pot. Yeah. Victor, maybe we could show that clip. We have one clip to show you all of, of one of the greatest jazz composers of the 20th century, Duke Ellington. In fact, we can even take the word jazz out of that. Okay. Great composers of all time. That's all. That's all right. So uh, Ellington speaks uh, right along the lines of what we're kind of at right now. And I think it'd be wonderful for you to see his words. Okay, here we go. Uh, I got to share sound. Okay. okay. Let me know if you can hear it. I think probably that ending uh, is sort of like the 
discussion about jazz. Jazz is a never-ending discussion. Uh, we have all sorts of thoughts about it from various people, some who know quite a bit about it and some who like to listen to it and others who are rather annoyed by it. And so it gives many, many points of view. Um, and the discussion is never finished. It's a very important subject. I, uh, when I was in Africa, in Senegal, I met uh, Papa Tao, a great Senegalese artist. And I was sort of giving him a theme on jazz because it's a constant question, what is jazz? What is jazz? And there's so many things. And I was busy ad-libbing this uh, sort of uh, extravagant picture of jazz. And I said, jazz is a tree. And it uh, has uh, many, many branches that reach out into many directions. Of course, it's goes into the far east and picks up an exotic blossom. At the end of each branch is a twig, and at the end of each twig there are many different shaped leaves and many vari-colored flowers, and, and it goes east, west, north, south, and everywhere. And everywhere it goes, it picks up some sort of certain influence. And if you uh, go back to the trunk, you'll find that it's probably a sort of transparent uh, bark we could say even made in Japan. And as it goes down into the deep roots that go way down into the earth, then you'll find out that these blue-blooded uh, black roots are deep in the soil of black Africa, which of course is the foundation of everything that is with the beat. The beat that of course today is the most listened to in the world. And um, jazz has many licenses, as I said before. The 2-4, uh, the 3-4, the 4-4, the and even the 5-4. There have been many, many great people in it. Um, and then, of course, it not only gets um, math highly mathematical, but it sometimes gets very romantic. I mean, for instance, Johnny Hodges was one of the great purveyors of the romantic and very soul-searching sounds that the, had the sort of pastel uh, veneer of compulsion to that I've heard. It's like when he did the Warm Valley. Uh, is that good? Yeah, that's yeah, good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I just love that analogy of the tree. You know, there's this tree with all these branches. And we're all on that tree. It's like it's our family tree. We're all on it. Nobody's off of it. It's such a beautiful metaphor. I just love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I wanted to mention that um, in terms of 
advancing equity, um, I'm very happy to say that the, the music department at Stony Brook is right now engaged in a serious reconstruction, review uh, of the entire music program with the purpose of, in fact, recognizing these contributions from jazz and the African American presence, which have long been ignored in most educational music departments across the country, even to the point where the language itself is sort of implicitly biased and exclusive. They, they talk about, well, here we will study Western music, but actually what they mean is they will study music mostly composed by white male European composers and some Americans too, ignoring the fact that, you know, there's West Africa, which is really at the same longitude as Europe, and there have been Black people in America since at least 1619. And so to speak of Western music and have that be only this uh, white structure of this is what, this is music, the other stuff is something else. So they, all across the country now, uh, educational institutions have, are really coming to grips with, with this prejudice and, and exclusion. And it's a, it's a very positive time in that sense that people say like, okay, this all has to change. And, and so in terms of advancing equity in higher education, there, I think there's nothing more important than realizing that even in the very terms that we use to talk about music, there's bias and exclusion. So um, even the whole idea that there's a there's legitimate music and then there's popular music. And so popular music, of course, is the music of the lower classes, you know, read, you know, people of color or just, you know, hillbilly stuff or something. And then there's like the legitimate, you, you know, so though all of those concepts really need to be thrown out, actually, <laughs> if not re-examined re at the least, and, and in many ways thrown out and replaced with something that is, in fact, much more inclusive of all the, the beautiful music of all the world, which is not to denigrate anything, but simply to say, we need to, we need to expand this and the level of respect that, that this music deserves. As Ellington said, this is the beat heard all over the world. And, and that respect concept, I think, is something that Ellington absolutely embodied, along with Billy Strayhorn, which is why we chose these four freedoms, because mm -hmm. although we're, we're focusing on four of them, the, the overarching theme of Billy Strayhorn was that he absolutely demanded freedom of expression. And he lived in, in what we consider not just four, but many, many important moral freedoms. And I thought maybe we'd start with the first one. And the first one was freedom from hate unconditionally. Freedom from hate unconditionally. And I think, Ray, this speaks to uh, what you and I have worked on a lot and you taught in your improvisation class at the university, the concept of yes, which is one of your first big lessons in your improvisation class. Can you speak a bit on, on that whole idea? Yeah, yeah, Can you sure. I, a bit on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, so I've been at Stony Brook since 2003, and before then, I was a performing musician, just traveling around the world, leading my, my bands. I'm not um, academically educated. My experience comes from the, the practice of the art, mostly. And one of the courses I first started teaching was this improvisation course, which is, you could say in a way, like pure improvisation in, in the sense that there are no parameters given. 
it's not in any genre. It's emphatically not a jazz improvisation class or a classical one. Or the idea is, can we just get together and make music which has meaning and feeling and beauty and all those things we want from music without deciding what we're going to do beforehand? So the the one of the principles, I, in fact, if you'll forgive me for the shameless plug, I am actually writing a book of this stuff and uh, it will be done by September. Of course, I don't know when it might be published, but I've been slowly, you know, compiling all these things and it seems like they, they actually should be written down <laughs> somewhere. So one of the most important things when you try and improvise in this way is the principle of yes. And that means that whatever anybody does, everyone responds with yes. Okay, that's what's entered the space and therefore that's what we're making music with right now. That idea, that sound, that texture, whatever somebody does with their instrument, you always have to say yes. And then each person's job then is to figure out what's the best response at this moment to that reality. So how do I support that? Or how do I join it? Or is it best for me to just be quiet right now and let that person have that, that space and not, not clutter up the space with anything? So there's all these sort of instantaneous decisions that, that one needs to make. But the principle of yes is very closely related to freedom from hate. It's like whatever that person who has like the most abhorrent political views to you, whoever that person is, you still have to say, yes, okay, those are their views. And yes, we, we accept that that's, that that's their views. That doesn't mean we have to agree with them, but we have to accept them. And that, I love that thing that somebody said that, that you know, if you just went into each person's personal history for a couple of generations, you would immediately understand why they are espousing those beliefs. Like everybody is, everybody is understandable if we just open our hearts up enough and say yes enough. So in this sense, this, this music class relates to a, a way of, of trying to uh, increase equity in, in the society. And on the bandstand, I mean, we, we absolutely do that. Right. Because when someone is, you know, especially if it's not a band you put together or a band you were invited to be in or a jam session where you don't know who's going to show up. Right. I mean, someone gets up and they start playing the solo and it's not your cup of tea. Right. But we don't pack up our horn and walk out. And right. Leave, you know, it's like right. you said, it's, oh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't like what you're saying. I don't like the way you're saying it. It's too loud. It's, you know, it's whatever it is. Yeah. But yeah. we say yes. yes. And then, like you said, right. then we join and the idea is to support to mm -hmm. encourage, and then the beauty of it is because of the mutual respect afforded to ourselves, well, when that person is done saying what they want to say, we will have the opportunity to respond, <laughs> and we can be heard, and we can say what we want to say. Right, right, yeah. right, and that's, uh, that's democracy. Yeah, you that's know, right. that's, that's, that's what that is, absolutely. That's right. You know, I love, there's a, a it speaks to the blues a lot too, because uh, um, there's a great clip, if you all want to check it out, there was a, a, a jazz hour, Art Ford's jazz hour back in the 50s on TV. And there's a wonderful one with Billie Holiday. And right after he introduces her, or the band is, is playing in the background, is Billie Holiday saying what she thinks the blues is. And she says that to her, it's, it's pretty sad, it's pretty sick, it's like going to church, it's being very happy. And then I love, she, she kind of stopped herself and said, well, you know, there's two kind of, kinds of blues. There's happy blues 
and there's sad news. And then, and then you know, she's she's getting into it. You can tell she's kind of like she's almost figuring it out. She's almost figuring yeah. out herself, and, and she says, you know, I don't think I ever sing the same way twice, and I don't sing the same tempos. And then she goes on, she says, you know, one night I sing a little slower, and the next night I sing it a little faster, depending on how I feel. And I love, she says, you know, she says, I don't know, the blues is kind of sort of a mixed up thing. You just have to feel it. Everything that I sing is part of my life. And that speaks to the honesty, right? And the vulnerability. And, and I think when we're talking about equity, like how hip if we as humans could take a cue from jazz and say, you know what? I struggle with this and I don't really know why I think this way or feel this way. And maybe it is because like you said, generation, no, I grew up and you know, maybe my mom, my dad, or my grandparents or where I grew up or whatever. Um, but how cool if we could have respectful conversation. Mm -hmm. And I love that you said listening because listening implies that we're silent. And we're quiet, right? <laughs> Which right. is so hard. Because right. so I know yeah. for me, lots of times I want to jump in and put my yeah. stuff in. Yeah. But yeah. you know, if you could afford that respect, and if that person could be speaking in honesty, and that conversation and dialogue, I mean, what a wonderful foundation to build with them, right? By right. saying yes, yes, I will listen to you. Yeah. Which means I will be silent for a while. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It's yeah. it's telling uh, that listen is an energy. Silent. That's right. Right. Yeah. That's exactly the same letters. You just rearrange them a little. Yeah. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, um, yeah. oh, you know, one other thing I wanted to add that I, I always add to Duke's thing about the, the tree and all that, because people say, well, what is jazz? And, and I, for years now, I've been saying, well, you know, jazz is an argument. Hmm. That's mm -hmm. what it is. It's an argument. It, mm -hmm. It's a conversation, but it, it is also an argument because from the and from the earliest beginnings of anybody like writing anything about jazz as opposed to just going and listening to it and enjoying it, which is maybe really what we all should do. <laughs> but, you know, there's this ongoing argument, as Duke was alluding to, it's like, you know, what it is and what it isn't and what it should be and what it shouldn't be mm -hmm. and who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong, you know. And it's all kind of humorous in a way, but but the, uh, the 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 principle of yes is that hey, this it's a huge tent. There's room for everybody. If you want to play that way, that's the way you should play. It. You know. Now I may not go to your concert, or I might <laughs> or not invite be, you into my band, or, or <laughs> you know, in my right. but, yeah, but, but that doesn't say. mean it's not all valid. Right. Yes. So respect the fourth. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Well, the second one that Strayhorn spoke of, the second freedom, was freedom from all self pity. And he added to that freedom from all self pity, even throughout all the pain and bad news. And for, for those of you out there that maybe do not know about Billy Strayhorn, I would encourage you this weekend to not only check out his music, but to find out a little bit about him and what made his relationship with Ellington so powerful and special. I'll, I'll very quickly just say um, Ellington, uh, uh, Strayhorn rather, was like Ellington, an African-American in a time where there was extreme racism in our country. Uh, they both, even if we do not make mention of the fact that the skin color was black, even if they were white, uh, it is important that we should mention that jazz was really looked down upon, and especially back in the time when Ellington and Strayhorn were writing, was not applauded, and there were not jazz studies programs, and it was thought of as pop music that was not really worthy of great notoriety. So they had that challenge against them, uh, especially in the earlier days. But Strayhorn also struggled with the fact that um, he was a homosexual at a time where that literally was illegal in the United States. So if you put all of those things together, um, the wow. fact that he's black, he's homosexual, he's playing a music at a time where it's not really celebrated, um, and he was not in any way trying to downplay this. He was openly homosexual mm -hmm. and openly vocal about the fact that these freedoms we're speaking about um, should apply to every human being. 
that it lives and breathes. So what that basically meant was he was blacklisted by, by many of the publishing companies that would not publish him, the clubs that would not hire him. Uh, but Ellington had already broken into the business, so to speak. He had the reputation, he had the band, he had the recording contracts. And what Ellington allowed was for a straight horn in a way for many years, especially in the earlier years, it eased as time went on, but it allowed Strayhorn to have his music published, have it recorded while kind of being behind the scenes. I don't know if that's a good way to put it mm -hmm. or describe it, but just kind of on mm -hmm. Ellington's mm -hmm. you know, coattails, although Ellington respected him tremendously for sure. But the second one, um, Freedom from All Self Pity, and I love the parentheses, you know, even for all the pain and bad moods, because I think. Man, if there's anybody that really experienced pain and bad moods, it would have been straight up. Absolutely. Right? Right. Absolutely. For sure. And uh, and if, if we tie that into uh, improvisation and music and all the stuff that we, we were just doing before we started here, um, another thing that I always have to get everyone to recognize is that we all have a fierce inner critic. That's the little voice in your head that says, you gotta be careful. I don't think you're doing this right. You know, don't don't say now don't say the wrong thing because you're you know on Zoom in a symposium and you know you might like make a mistake and commit some kind of gaffe. So be very, very careful. <laughs> you know like we all have a critic like that. And when it comes to creativity, the, the critic is is actually a hindrance in that the critic wants everything to be perfect, but creativity is never perfect. It's a, it's a perfect imperfection. So that voice, you know, when you're a kid and you throw a giant tantrum in, in the supermarket or something, and you know, because you want the fruit loops and you know, Yet then eventually, it, and you know, your dad or your mom lets you know in no uncertain terms that that is not the way to get the Fruit Loops. Like that's not going to work. We're definitely not buying those now. You know what I mean? So we learn, you know, we learn how to, to behave in society, which of course is an absolutely necessary and wonderful thing. When it comes to music, the critic is. And actually, most in there, the critic is very much part of what comprises our work ethic. Like you know, that voice in the head say, like, yo, Anderson, you gotta get to work. You haven't done this stuff yet. And you know, it's like you need to practice. And that, you know, that's a, there's a real value to the critic. But the critic will prevent you from taking a risk. And creativity is all about risk and failure. Art is about failure. If there's no failure, that meant, means you didn't take any risks. If there's no risks, there's really no possibility that you're gonna create something new right. or something that's uniquely your own. And, and that, that failure piece is so great because mm -hmm. I loved, uh, and I picked this up from your improvisation class, that quote, by Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson, which I wrote down for us today, where he said, do not be too timid and squeamish about your actions. All life is an experiment. And the more experiments you make, the better. And he says, what if they're a little coarse and you may get your coat soiled or torn? What if you do fail and get fairly rolled around in the dirt once or twice? Yeah. Up again, you shall never be so afraid of a tumble. I love that. Yeah. Like the failure yeah. is in there. It's like, yeah. you're going to fail. You're going to fall. You're going to get dirty. You're going to rip your coat. You're going to be a mess. Yeah. But man, that'll build some character and some strength. You won't be afraid of that again. You right. won't be afraid of taking the risk. Right. 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 Great. right. Yeah. Mr. Emerson. Yeah. Well, I, there's a, a, a very famous book that a lot of people know when they're getting into jazz. And it's one of those, you know, at least years ago, it was like the academic book to read. The, the Cambridge Companion to Jazz. And, and there's some good stuff in it. I shouldn't be critical when we're talking about the critic. But I love the introduction. In the introduction, um, it says, radical innovators, however talented, are likely at first to be marginalized or, or condemned as incompetent and almost inevitably attract the hostility of those whose sense of security 
musical, psychological, or economic, is derived from their acceptance of the aesthetic status quo. Absolutely true. Man, that right. like, to me, I, I just right. like that intro. I, I, I yeah. think it speaks volumes, especially when we're talking about people's sense of security. And yeah, we're talking about jazz and music, but yeah, that goes deeper. That goes psychological. It's economic. It's it's, it's so many things, right? Yes. Yes, and and I and I do think it's relevant to the the cause of advancing equity in in higher education. In that, just being aware that all these students come in with their own version of the critic, mm -hmm. and may well need encouragement to experiment and risk and take a tumble and and. Uh, you know, allow that possibility of, of failure. So I think it's, it's a very, very important part of, uh, of education. Okay. Yeah. 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 Victor, do we have any questions that might be relevant? Like I said, the chat is so far away, I can't really see it. We didn't get questions, but we got two nice comments. One is, I notice how you would change tempo together just using body language and listening to each other. Mm -hmm. And the response to that was, yes, reminds me of the relationship between a singer and pianist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, those are good points. Yeah. Very good points. Yeah. Well, I think that segues nicely, actually, into the third freedom we want to speak on. And, and that was the freedom from the fear of possibly doing something that might help another more than it would help himself. The freedom from the fear of possibly doing something that might help another more than it would help himself. And I, I think, you know, in conversations, we do that a lot, like, you know, to choose to allow someone to continue on with their thoughts rather than maybe jumping in or cutting them off and interjecting your own. Um, but that speaks to respect. Um, I think that speaks to patience and timing, things that are very important in music. I know we are absolutely doing that in our dialogue here, um, but we also do it in our play big time. And, and on so many levels, I, I, you know, it's just like if Ray's soloing, you know, I, I'm, first of all, I'm paying attention as if it was a conversation, as if he was speaking to me. I, I'm not ignoring him, I'm not looking on my phone, I'm not just ignoring him and waiting for my time to speak. But I'm also thinking on a, on a second level, wow, how can I support what he's saying? And sometimes it's by staying out of the way, but sometimes it might be by playing in the background or by joining him, like you said, joining is an option. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's on a deeper level even than that. Like, like sometimes if, if I mean, I'm sure Ray, you've experienced this. Like, if, if I'm in the band and and there were two solos before me that were rather lengthy, and I know I'm next, but Ray has to go after me. Well, I might cut mine a little short and sacrifice a little of my time so that Ray gets some time because I might be thinking in my head, well, man, if I play the solo as long as the two guys that came before me, he might just not play at this point because we're gonna have a 20 minute song you know it depends on the situation but i think we're always thinking about that that dialogue and being sensitive i think is the word to wow how can i support everyone in this band the best either by what i'm doing or, or by what i'm not doing sometimes yeah right i guess i support this by what i'm not doing yeah right <laughs> yeah the the uh the, the skill being the ability to hear the entirety of what's being played, which includes what has been played already, as well as what's unfolding right now in this in this instance. So that's a that's a learnable skill, but not something that people necessarily automatically come in knowing. And when you're, when you're improvising, it's really essential if we're going to build the kind of unity of, of sound and intention that we, that we want. But I, I think another thing that's really important about this freedom number three, the freedom from the fear of possibly doing something that might help another one, 
more than it would help yourself, it is humility. You know, it, humility is a really necessary quality or attitude to have. And it is wonderful how music will automatically teach you that because you just can't ever really do what you really wanted to do. <laughs> you know, in other words, the, the, the joy of being a musician is very much connected to the fact that it never ends. It's just a lifelong study. You never get it. There's always another level. Right. Uh, I think that that, that, that Elizabeth Gilbert, as you said, that there's always another level up. There's always another ascension. There's a, yeah, I mean, we just came out with a documentary film on, on Doc Severance, and he's 93. And I watched it, and the whole film, the theme was like, he's still practicing. He's going to the gym three times a day. He's still trying to get better. He's 93 years old. Yeah, the guy's yeah, been doing this for yeah. like seven decades. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? But he's yeah. still going. But I think deeper, and, and this is where with my students, I always say like, hey, I'm coming from the place of jazz and the, the platform of music, but you can fill in your own blank depending on what your level of study is. So when, when I'm talking about the next level, that next ascension musically, well, you could talk about having not just more talent or ability, it could be more grace, it could be more light, more compassion, more, right. more right. patience with people, um, and really just more to grow, I think, which is right. such a great lesson out right. of music. Absolutely. Right. We, we have a, a comment and a question. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, the the comment is: I came in late, but I love the musician's perspective with the themes of the day. So glad I got to hear you speaking on these topics. Uh, now for the question: My partner is Puerto Rican and a musician, and he has a hard time speaking up for himself in his projects. One band member would place him in front of the photographs of the band and then behind the scenes record over his parts on the albums and take credit for the band being their vision. Oh, that's not good. How do you help musicians stand up for themselves is the question. Oh, that's a good question. We, we certainly all struggle with that. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there and have had quite a long career and have always been really terrible at the job of promoting Ray Anderson. It's almost as if then there's Ray Anderson who's a, a musician and an artist and creates music and plays trombone. And then there's this need for some other Ray Anderson who's this promoter of that guy, Ray Anderson. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that promoter, that promoter is really like not on the case at all. <laughs> and so, so it's a, that's a really good question because it, there's no simple answer to that. I think that if you, the, the core is believe in yourself, keep doing what you're doing, pursue what you're hearing, and I do also demand respect. I had that experience when I was very young. I was, uh, I had just gotten to New York. I was 20 years old or 21 years old. And I was playing in a, in a big rhythm and blues band that um, had some backing from a rich somebody or other lawyer guy and stuff. And so, uh, so we eventually made a record for Warner Brothers, which you know at that point was a really big label. It was kind of a big thing. And we're hoping that this group you know, has a big following and a hit record and all, you know, anyway, uh, we're all into it. And, and we recorded this stuff and we sent it off to Los Angeles to be printed. And when it came back, somebody out there in Los Angeles had erased a bunch of the horn lines that I had composed in, in you know, as my part of the band. We just had a tenor and a trombone. That was the horn, so we had these two horns. And, but when the record came back, not only were there now five horns, but they weren't playing what, <laughs> what, 
what was our part of the tune, you know. And, and I did quit the band at that moment. I did quit the band it, because it, it wasn't as if anybody asked me if they could do that. And it wasn't as if anybody said, well, listen, we could add a baritone saxophone and, and wouldn't that sound great? And what do you think of that? It was just this high-handed record company stuff, you know, which yeah. sounds a bit like what you're talking about in the comment. And uh, don't be afraid to quit. Yeah. And I think that the one thing I would add to that is when you're in a band, and I know I could speak to this, especially with Ray here, because we've shared the stage so many times in so many different formats from New Orleans parade bands to big bands to combos to duos to what you name it. Kind of been there, which is such a blessing and such a gift. Um, but there is this wonderful world of the word called trust. Mm. And when you get together in a band with a group of individuals, you are in fact placing your you are trusting them, and you're you're choosing to make something important to you vulnerable to the actions of someone else. And, and when you, when I heard that story, what it sounded to me like was like uh, your husband has made something that's very important to him, his music, vulnerable to these band members, but they are kind of breaking their trust with him, and, and there's not respect there. So what I would say is to absolutely advocate for yourself, and what Ray said is right, you know, sometimes you do need to move on. Yeah. Some things are for a season, and there's been times, and it's hard. Well, I've had to stop gigs or bands or venues, and, and you know, there's no judgment, and there's always a polite, respectful, loving way to do that. But sometimes, yeah, you do have to advocate for yourself, right? Yeah. And ask yourself, you know, is my trust in these people being that being um, respected? Or, um, right, right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And, and, it's, and of course, it's complicated because, of course, you're not. You know, I certainly am not, and certainly was not back then when they erased my lines from this record, the best musician out there or anything even remotely, vaguely like that. So you do always have to also at the same time say like, uh, gee, maybe I really need to work on my stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to, you know, right. Maybe yeah. I need to actually, maybe this is telling me there's something about my actual musicianship or playing mm -hmm. that, well, maybe it wasn't quite up to, up to snuff, you know? And so maybe there's a, maybe there's a lesson in there as well of like, okay, that's just the Emerson tumble and mm -hmm. your clothes got a little dirty and you just get up and you like spend a lot of time practicing and working on your stuff, right. you know. Right. So, it, so you, you you have to make that you got to make that call, you know. Yeah, yeah, super. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we'll move on to the last freedom we wanted to speak about. And uh, Strayhorn says that that last freedom is the freedom from the kind of pride that could make a man feel he was better than his brother or neighbor. Freedom from the kind of pride that could make a man feel that he was better than his brother or his neighbor. And uh, there's a quote that I think of that was uh, by a, a man who was a, a wonderful producer. Um, and and the, the title and label they gave him was an impresario. His name was Marlon Brands. And if it wasn't for a few guys whose names we don't know, um, there's a lot of musicians and music we would not know of, or, or, or maybe we would have known of it, but maybe it wouldn't have come about when it did. Uh, Norman Grants absolutely brought a lot of people to the forefront of popularity of, of American popular music throughout the 20th century. John Hammond was another person that did that. And what was beautiful about a lot of these individuals is um, they were white, but they were not racist. Let's just call it the way it is. And they really fought hard for equality in the business. Um, Norman Grants was known for having a, a lawyer full time that would have contracts meticulously drawn up. He would send his bands out on tour, people like Ben Goodman, Billy Holiday, and 
you know, all sorts of Charlie Parker, all these great players, and they'd be armed with like legal papers when the hotel said, oh no, you can't spend the night here, or no, this is going to be a segregated audience. Um, and, and there was a wonderful quote that he said that, that speaks to that, that freedom from that pride. He said, jazz is America's own. He said, it is played and listened to by all peoples in harmony together. Pigmentation differences have no place. Now, this is a quote from almost seven decades ago now. I do realize that there, there is maybe the word pigmentation in the 21st century may not be the first one we would choose. But I, I think back to the theme of conversation, it is so important that we don't erase these things, but we actually take them out into the light and speak about them. I know there's a lot of, of conversation when it comes to American popular cinema of the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and, and sometimes later, unfortunately, for that nature. Like, okay, this isn't actually right now. Like, do we just stop showing it and lock it away and hide it? Or do we still allow it to be shown and exist and have the conversation about why this is wrong and what was going on in that time period? Um, but I think when, when we talk about this um, freedom, this freedom from that pride that would make you think that you're better than someone else, um, that definitely speaks to the actual core of democracy. Absolutely. Do you want to start right. that one off and then I'll pick it up? Yeah, <laughs> well, well, yes. And we um, spoke of this earlier that a, a, a functioning jazz band is democracy in action. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely democracy in action. If we're playing any kind of uh, somewhat traditional jazz or whatever we might want to call it, it's like you need a rhythm section. In other words, you need some people who are selflessly going to set up the framework for the horn players to expound or do their thing. In other words, in a, in a band, it only sounds as good as its weakest link. And everybody has to contribute to the overall sound. In other words, everyone has to take the responsibility for the overall sound of the band and do whatever they can do to make it sound better. So and, that's and we a call that, And we call that swing. That's we call that, that swing. When we say exactly. the band swing and man's swing. swing, that means that we're, we're responsible to, to nurture the common good exactly. for everyone in the band in fine balance. And, and I love that you use that word framework because when I think of democracy, like when I think of the, the forefathers designing the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. there was this framework. But what was so cool was it was a loose framework. It, there was a structure there, but it allowed for allowed for interpretation. It allowed for there to be some breathing room. It yeah. wasn't so rigid, you know. It. it we improvise in jazz, which is a wonderful metaphor for like our individual rights and freedoms. I get to say what I want to say, how I want to say it. Exactly. You know, and, exactly. and the swinging is the common good of the band. And, and there's that blues, which means that like no matter how bad things get, we're still mindful of our problems. We have the conversation about them, but we're optimistic that things will get better. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through the through the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um the, the asker of the last question wants to thank both of you for your thoughtful responses. Oh cool. Yeah. Yes, That's very kind. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. You. So um at this time, how are we doing? Yeah, we're doing good on time. We do want to leave a little time at the end. Um, but, but just building a little bit more on comfort of uh, democracy for a, a few few more minutes here. I, you know, I think one of the beautiful things about democracy that we share in jazz is this guiding principle, um, which is that of choice. And in, in democracy, as far as we think of it as governmental, that, that's our free and fair elections. But in jazz, when we're improvising, um, our, our spontaneous, melodic, harmonic, whatever it may be, 
organizations, those those predictions are indeed very fair. And I, I think choice is a wonderful word to include in the dialogue with democracy. Yes, and I think um, also one of the lovely paradoxes about the whole thing and, and about democracy is it itself is that in many ways, a band does need a leader. Mm -hmm. There are bands that are entirely cooperative, but even inside of them, usually someone is more responsible for this and leads in that aspect and someone leads in this aspect. So you, you both need to have a leader and everyone in the band needs to be able to lead. So typically everyone has a space where they get get to solo, but the band as a whole often functions best if there is in fact a leader who will say, okay, guys, here's what we're gonna play. Here's the set list, this tune, this tune, this tune, and it's two sets and we take a break, you know, and, and we need a leader in, in functioning democracies too, but it's, it's, we need a leader with wisdom and compassion and one who says yes and one who has humility like this is speaking of the freedom from pride mm -hmm. that could make you know because and it does happen in bands where there's band leaders who are kind of universally disliked by the people they hire yeah. <laughs> because their leadership style, style is, is suffocating and it doesn't really give people the, the chance to blossom and be who they are. Instead, it's this feeling of like, well, you're working for me. Mm -hmm. So you do this and you don't do that. And there's a fine line there where you're really, you know, encouraging creativity and where you're just cranking out a product. And, and I think there's a, there's a spirit in a true democracy. The spirit in a true democracy is collaboration. Right. And, and we absolutely practice that on the bandstand. I think there's a question too, that definitely comes up both if we're talking about democracy as far as the nation, um, as we're, if we're talking about leadership like you brought up or on the bandstand. And the, the question that confronts us in jazz, as well as in, in, in politics, if, if we throw that word out there, is really the question is, do we want to find a better way? Do we want to find a better way? And when we're struggling and wrestling, and I loved what you were saying earlier about like jazz is an argument. Yeah. You know, lots of in lots of ways that argument is is like, well, what's the best way to do this? Yeah. What's the best way to have this song come out? And if we answer affirmative, we will absolutely make it through the challenges. And, and if we decide no, we want to be our worst selves, well, we're going to struggle. And, we, and we've had gigs where we're struggling. Yeah, we yeah. Because people oh, do yeah. not want to find their best way. And I, I think that really speaks to democracy. I think there's a wonderful parallel there between. Grooving, grooving on that question, we have uh, how do you teach that democracy in your students, which I think you touched upon. And a follow up question to that is how do you handle pride issues? Mm. Great oh. question. Man, I, uh, I think it depends on the situation. But I have found that, you know, I forget who said it, but, you know, Somebody said once that the only antidote to destruction is creation. And I find that if I'm dealing with somebody that's really prideful, their main job, and you know, they're just trying to pull themselves up and build themselves up, rather than fight it, I will just absolutely embrace it with love. And, and I will just try and not necessarily maybe perpetuate it. <laughs> but 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 I really feel like like lots of times that that probably is somebody that needs to be affirmed. That's probably somebody that needs to be told that they're doing a good job. Right. Um, you know, there, there's again, I don't know who said it, but I believe it's true, you know, behind every ego is, is just incredible insecure. So you know, I just try and you know, not to sound like a whole lot. Idea, but I just try to show love, and and man, that's jazz too. You know, I mean, there's times on the bandstand where 
our chops, our, our little embouchure is hurting. You know, I need help. And man, the guys in the band could leave me hang out to dry, and they could say, "Well, you need to practice more." And that's probably true. <laughs> but man, there's something about when the band rallies behind you in love, and it's like, "Man, Tom certainly needs our help. Let's let's give him a background here. So let's kind of go." Yeah. Down. Or if I'm like yeah. not hearing the chords, the piano player could be like, "Well, I you need to learn your changes." But you know, then I could hear they're kind of helping me out and they're feeding me a better. little better you know I mean, that's love that's like that's like you know to like figuratively that's someone like man i mean i got i got you you know that's like right you know and i love that you jazz got you. like and that's the beautiful thing about jazz is you know you could stand up and you could play the best solo and the guys on the band said like yeah man and you could stand up and you could lay down the worst thing you played ever in your life and those same guys will look at you and they'll go yeah man yeah, man. Yeah, right. Because they've been there. You it's know? all yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I don't know if I got a little off, off topic there, but I, I feel like when it comes to pride, um, that's a wonderful way. Or, or it, again, back to the conversation, like maybe you could redirect the conversation about someone like a good stray one, which might offer some perspective, which might initiate mm. some humility, mm. which might deflate the pride. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. And I, it, it is true that studying music will automatically bring humility. So I think Tom's right in that when pride is sort of being excessively displayed, it, it's covering insecurity. And the best way to deal with that is, is just respect it. Tom's so, so, so in love, you know, we'll walk away. <laughs> you know? uh, but if, if you really get into studying music, you, you just realize how much more infinite it is than what you're able to accomplish in this, in this lifetime. So how prideful can you be? You know, it's, it, it, so that, that might be something to, in some way, allude to a, a, a Billy Strayhorn or a John Coltrane or someone else, Yasha Heifetz or, a, you know, whoever this person actually ad, admires and just talk about what they said about how aware they were of their ignorance and, and shortcomings, maybe you could kind of bring up these type of examples. I'll use myself too. I find some ways the best way is to turn it on you. You know, I mean, I'll say with my students a lot, I'll say, man, I was reading, preparing for this class. I had no clue about this or that or whatever. You know, and I find some ways that, that kind of knocks down some walls and barriers, you know? If you could just yeah. be honest and not, you know, it, it's like that age old thing where, you know, a student asks you a question, you have to have an answer because you have this title in front of you. <laughs> You're a professor at a major university. You know, I mean, man, I have no clue, but I'll absolutely have an answer for you next class. You know what I mean? Yeah, right, like, just right. having the humility right. to just put it down there. And, right. You know, are there other questions? Because we want to have some, um, some time at the end here for questions. So anything about the music, anything about what we spoke, anything about ourselves? Uh, while we leave it open to questions, I want to plug the Jazz Loft. I'm going to drop uh, the URL into the chat. Thank you. Great. Yeah, we are here at the Jazz Loft, by the way. I did not mention that. And Ray and I are very fortunate to be on the board of directors here. And it is a wonderful not for profit organization that advocates for jazz through preservation, a 6,000 square foot museum, through education, wonderful relationship we have with Stony Brook University, as well as so many public and private schools, colleges and universities all throughout Long Island, New York, and even the East Coast and beyond. And uh, performance, we present over 160 performances a year here that span all the styles of jazz and present a multitude of, of different kinds of music. Um, it's a wonderful space, unlike any, really, not only on Long Island, but in, in the country. There are not many places you could go 
for the our lifeless to our, our wonderful country from coast to coast. So if you haven't been here, uh, we are kind of still quasi closed with COVID. Um, you have to come and check this out. We're stone's throw from Stonebridge University. Uh, we're like three minutes down the road. So, and I want to point out that you are with the founder and president of the Jazz Lab, Tom Mandel's idea, and he created this incredible space. So we're just very, very lucky to have such an amazing place right here in our community. Now, I, I know people may be tuned in from all over the world here. So um, when you get to New York, or if you get to Stony Brook or the Eastern Long Island, definitely do not fail to come and check this out because it, it's a museum as well as a performance space and an educational space. So there's lots going on. You could come just and check out the museum in the daytime and see amazing stuff. <laughs> there's amazing stuff in here. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, that's the jazz life. That's right. Any other questions, Victor? No, uh, there was one question as to the location of the Jazz Loft, and I'm going to drop the Google Map URL in chat. So that'll like literally take you to the location. Well, we're right in Stony Brook Village. Mm -hmm. So we're a stone store from the university. And even if you're in Connecticut, we're just, you know, a ferry ride across the sound, and we're here. So kind of a great location. Yeah, the jazzloft.org. Right, we'll get you to the website and the address and directions. Groovy. Uh, I think we're good on questions. No one has dropped anything in chat. Okay. No, I think we're ready to wrap up. Okay. Well, I want to thank Ray Anderson for being a part of this. It's always an honor to be able to share the stage with them, whether it's working with students or performing or workshop or clinic or symposium like this we really are so so honored and blessed that he's running the jazz program at the university and uh, Ray, i want to thank you for, uh, for doing this yeah. and, and victor thank you for Pleasure. your help yeah, up thanks, to this thanks. and yeah. testing the equipment and uh, making everything happen and thank you to the library at the university for putting this wonderful symposium together and to everybody that joined us thank you for joining and mm -hmm. feel free to reach out to us we are available if there's other questions you might have or dialogue we that's been the theme of this whole thing we want to keep the conversation going so please reach out to us and Absolutely. Uh, we hope that we, what we shared with you was inspiring we hope it could be useful in the classroom if, you, if that's where you're coming from or in your workplace or whatever walk of life you have this is a beautiful beautiful music and it just celebrates so much great stuff and man we can't have enough beauty so let's keep that going let's keep that going yeah. absolutely all right all right well thank you all and this was fantastic it was a real deep conversation that was fantastic um I'm about to end it. I wish all of you well. Thank you again. And following uh, the next thing on the symposium is going to be the closing remarks. Oh, oh yeah, which is going to be the main link. But for now, goodbye and take care, everybody. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye. you so much for joining us.